Are you ready to get in the Word today? Okay, all right, let's go. So we, we started a few weeks ago on this series called Acts, and really we're just going through the book of Acts. And we, so we've talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about how the, the disciples in chapter 1, they prepared for what was yet to come. Jesus hadn't quite yet ascended yet. And he says, hey, I need you to wait for the promise. The promise is about to come. And so there was this preparation that the people went through for the promise. And we see this beginning in Acts 1-5. And then there was a praying into the promise. You saw the people in the, in the later part of chapter 1. What did they do? They went and prayed. They prepared their heart for what was yet to come. What would it look like if we prepared our heart heart every single day for a new and fresh coming of the Holy Spirit. What would that look like in our own life? The Holy Spirit is here, but I'm just saying kind of figuratively speaking, if we prepared our spirit and our heart for what God had in store for us every single day, would our life be different? Absolutely, absolutely it would. And so they begin to pray into this promise. They begin, then once the promise came, the promise of the Holy Spirit, we see this in the beginning of Acts chapter 2. We see the coming of the Holy Spirit. And man, this was, a, this was the event of the events. This was the greatest event ever. That the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost descended into a room and there was a sound like a rushing wind that took place. And then all of a sudden fire came down. I'm I'm picturing in my head, I know know this probably is and doesn't do anything justice, but I'm I'm picturing like this fire tornado. Have you ever seen forest fires when then all of a sudden there's just this fire that looks like a tornado? It's like this whirlwind of, of fire. This is what I'm picturing in my own mind like this is probably what it looked like I know that they're trying to describe a supernatural thing and the best thing that they could come up with that it looked like fire and then all of a sudden it split over everybody and tongues of fire was there and then this miraculous thing took place where all of a sudden people began to speak in other languages and this incredible thing, and, I, and, and jokingly I said, you know, for all the charismatic and pe- Pentecostal, like, yes, this is exactly what we are all waiting for and what we all want, and we want more of that. We want more speaking in tongues. We want all of this. And we understand that the Holy Spirit coming, when he shows up, supernatural things take place. When the Spirit of God is here, supernatural things take place. You know, we all emphasize, uh, you know, as a charismatic, you, you emphasize this speaking in tongues and all that. But there's many other gifts, and we, we like to highlight this lesser gift, right? But there are plenty of other ones that the Holy Spirit wants to give us, but we kind of focus on that. And so last week I said, hey, you know what, if this is something you're praying for, you're praying into, hey, in his perfect timing, you're not anything lesser. You're not a JV Christian because you don't have this. God will do this in his perfect timing. Just trust him. And, and really, just take the focus off of that. Just focus on the Lord and see what he does. And so we see this great event that takes place. And then what? And then Peter, he gets up. And he starts telling people, hey, look, I know that you guys think that these people are drunk, but they're really not drunk because it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. And there's this great event that takes place. He says, this is what what the prophet Joel began to say when he prophesied about the Holy Spirit, that he would pour his spirit out on on everyone. And what was going to happen is that young men would see visions and there would be prophecies and there would be dreams and there would be all of this, these things that were taking place. And he's saying, look, this is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit right now. And so you need to understand, this is, we are living in the moment right now. This is the fulfillment of this prophecy. And this is what really what just gets me just absolutely fired up when we, when we begin to see just playing out in real time when prophecy begins to just line up with current events, what's really taking place. And so what we witness here is this beginning of the fulfillment of the prophecy Joel. And he continues to talk about these signs and wonders that were going to take place, but he also did something else. Besides talk about all of the good things, he also began to say some things 
that were not as good. He condemned those who were there that crucified Jesus. And it was through this, 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 Telling people, because sometimes I don't think they realize, even those people, even though they weren't around, because of the sin in their life, he said, no, you, well, you helped crucify Jesus. And I don't know about you, but if, if somebody tells me that I had a hand in this very thing, man, I would be absolutely convicted. I, I, would, I, I, don't, know what I, I don't know what I would do, honestly. But we see that there was conviction and it says that they were, they were pierced to the heart because of this message. They said, you know, all these signs and wonders, all these wonderful things, but at the same time, you need to realize your part in what all took place. And because of that, we begin to see a stirring that takes place. And this is where we begin and we pick up. In the passage, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 2 and starting in verse 29. It says, Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. But be, being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he's talking about Jesus. And he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus raised up, and, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. He's saying the Holy Spirit is poured out right here and now. You're seeing this. You are witnessing this with your very own eyes. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain. Everybody say certain. That leaves no uncertainty, right? We want to know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. This Jesus who what? Who you crucified. And now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do? What do we do? See, I, I pray that every message, every time we show up together, every time we gather on a Sunday, we leave here with that question. What do we do now? What is it that we are to do? Do we leave here the same? Do we leave here on a mission? Do we leave here commissioned? Do we leave here uh, encouraged? What is it that we leave here with? What do we do with this information? This is what they're saying. And, th and there's only one conclusion that you can come to through reading this text. The only conclusion, that, the only answer that Peter can, can give the people that were asking this question is this, this idea that we are convicted of sin, that we recognize our state uh, of being, that we know that there's only one way to remedy this sin condition that we have, this thing that we are totally apart from God, that we played a part in the crucifixion of Christ. There's only one thing that we can do, and that is to repent. See, there are many pastors and many churches that love talking about the love of Christ and how much he loves you and his unconditional love and all of the things, all of the goodness of that, but we fail sometimes to preach about repentance. We see, see we, we think that we're just going to love people into something. We think we're going to love people into the kingdom of God. And there's a part of that. But there's also a part that is called conviction. And through conviction that leads to repentance. And we've got to recognize what is happening in our own life. What part that we took. What part did I take. What sin in my life was what put Jesus on the cross that I need to repent for. See, sometimes we think, oh, Jesus just loves me no matter what. Yes. It's unconditional love, and we just highlight that. Failing to look in the mirror at all the junk that's in our life. 
everything that we have that's going on that is absolutely foreign to the Lord. The way we live, the way we think, the way we talk. Our lifestyles, our habits, our addictions. All of those things are the very things that put Jesus on the cross. So what do we do? Our only conclusion is to repent. Well, what is repentance? Repentance is this, is that is if I am on a path going in this direction, repentance is saying I am stopping what I am doing. I am stopping the thought. I am stopping the language. I am stopping the action. I am stopping everything that is, that is contrary to the word of God. And what I'm doing is I'm saying, Lord, forgive me now. Thank you for your forgiveness of what you did on the cross to pay the price for that forgiveness. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this way and I'm going to walk the other way and I'm never looking back. See, true repentance means that we're not going to keep going back this way. True repentance means that we are going to turn our back to the sin, turn our back to whatever it is that we were doing, and we're never going back. But why is it that we just constantly keep going back to that same well. Why why, why do we love to camp out right here? Because I, I believe that we didn't truly repent. We didn't really mean it. We find ourselves maybe in a sketchy situation and we're like, oh Lord, I'm sorry for that. Please forgive me. Help me to get out of this. And so then we kind of do this, but but we're, we're still, we're kind of, we kind of have one toe still in, in there. Can I, can I get a, away from it, but still kind of stay, stay there? I'm going to pay for that later. Just like sin. You're going to pay for that later. But see, if we don't recognize the sin in our life, if we don't recognize the standard by which God has placed in order for us to live by, if we don't understand that, then we don't know what we're supposed to repent of. Well, I want this thing called repentance. I want this thing called forgiveness, but I don't know what I'm doing wrong. And see, this is why it's important for you to be in the Word of God. Because it's all plain in here. And when you begin to be led by the Spirit, when you begin to invite the Holy Spirit to begin to do a work in you, this process called sanctification, as He begins to highlight areas of your life, when He says, you know what, this one area of your life needs to be taken care of. I want you to give it to me. I don't, I, I, I don't just want you to give it to me. I want you to be free from it. And the Spirit of God, he is, he is wonderful when it comes to that, is that when we go running to Him and we say, Lord, help me, forgive me, He is quick to come and rescue us, yes, but there's a caveat in that. He's like, I'm going to do this, but there's, there's a part that you're going to play too. There's a part that you're going to play that's called repentance. I've convicted you of sin. Now your part is to confess it and say, I don't want to go there anymore. And many times when we're ruled by the flesh, we want to keep going back. But when we're ruled by the Spirit, man, there's something great takes place. See, there's this fruit called the fruit of the Spirit. And there's one that's called self-control. And when we're ruled by the Spirit of God, He helps us to control our habits, our hang-ups, Helps us in the way of conviction. Shows us the way. 
See, when we talk about the book of Acts, and we, especially when we talk about chapter 2, we always want to jump to the good part. We want to stick to, hey, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and let's just go, skip all of this other part, and let's just get to the part where it talks about, hey, the fellowship of believers, that, man, it, it was just this awesome party. But there's this part in between that took place, this message that Peter gave the people that said, hey, here is what you have got to do in order for us to get to this fellowship where everybody had everything in common, everybody shared their, their possessions, everybody enjoyed the faith of everybody, all those great things, there was something that had to take place before that. But see, we like the easy, we want an easy button when it comes to the fellowship of believers. We want to skip to the good part where we're just saying, hey, we're just enjoying, uh, just, we're just enjoying church together. Can we just skip the part of repentance? Can we just skip the part of conviction and just get to that part? Because that's the feel-good stuff. That's the part that, man, I want to I just, man, I love that part. Do I really have to look in the mirror? Do I really have to evaluate my life? Do I really need to examine what is going on in my life? Do I need to examine my lifestyle? Do I need to examine my thought process? Do I need to examine how I treat people? Do I need to examine how I treat my kids, my wife? Do I need to examine how I, I am, I'm at, at my workplace? Do I need to examine those things? Can we just get to the good part? Peter is saying, we ain't skipping the good part yet. Here's what you need to do. You need to repent. It says this in verse 38. It says, Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sin and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise, you and, the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone of whom... The Lord our God calls to himself, and, and with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. For those, those who received his word, they were baptized, and they were added about 3,000 people. See, even back then, there was a crooked generation. We think, oh man, we're the only crooked generation. We're the only, we got it worse than anybody else. Man, just look at what's going on around us. No, this was, this was happening back then. Here's, what, here's the thing. There ain't nothing new under the sun. We are on repeat. Every time, like literally every time human nature takes over, things kind of go the heck in a handbasket. Or we're in church, I guess you could say to hell in a handbasket, right? You see, Peter, he didn't belabor the part that everybody was speaking in tongues. He didn't, he didn't belabor all of those other things. He went straight to the message of Jesus Christ. He, he went straight to the message of Christ in him crucified. And see, I think this is where there, there's really something there that we need to take notice is that we can get hung up on all of these other peripheral things like speaking in tongues and miss the message of Jesus Christ. And Peter, right here, being full of the Spirit, he said, hey, let's not get hung up on that. Let's get to the real matter of the things. The real matter of the things is that you need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. The kingdom of God is coming. The kingdom of God is coming. And so how do you prepare for that? You repent. See, I feel like sometimes in church world, we're in this little bubble. And in this little bubble, we're like, Through this bubble, we're immune to sin. 
We're immune to the ways of the world. Let me just tell you that the enemy doesn't care about four walls of the church. The enemy has infiltrated the church in many ways. And one of the greatest ways he's infiltrated into the church is through lack of repentance. When people are not ready to confess Christ and him crucified. Peter said, repent, be baptized, and receive the Spirit. And it's through this repentance. Can you imagine what baptizing 3,000 people look like? Man, this is talk about, I mean, who knows how long this even took, right? I mean, it, it takes us a good 20 minutes to baptize, you know, 10, 12 people. 3,000 people, they were probably being baptized for days. I think about, uh, anybody watch the, the uh, Jesus, I think it was called the Jesus movie, and, and down in, in Pirate's Cove in California, and they baptized, I don't know how many thousand people, how long that took, and how great of a celebration. That's actually happened a few times, you know, back in the Jesus movement, back in the 60s. What would it look like if we baptized 3,000 people here? What would it look like if, if it's not just, you know, we, there's not 3,000 people here right now. But what would it look like if in, throughout the city of Tacoma, what if Parkland, USA, what if, what if all of the churches all got together and baptized thousands of people together? What would that look like? Man, that would be an incredible sight. It would take us a couple days to do it, I'm sure. And everybody's back would be hurting. I know, I talked to Pastor Nathan after doing like 10 baptisms. He's like, oh my goodness, my back is killing me. 3,000 people. 3,000 people getting saved. I've shared this before, but back in the 80s, I lived in Argentina, and, and I, I was able to witness and be a part of one of the greatest revivals that ever took place in South America. This, this evangelist by the name of Carlos Anacondia, he came to our city, court of Argentina, and, and what he did uh, through his campaign and through, through just, just preaching simple, Christ-centered uh, messages, preaching him and preaching Jesus Christ to people. People came by the thousands and thousands and thousands. A hundred thousand people got saved in a course of about 60 days. This was 60 days consecutive nights. Can you imagine 60 consecutive nights? We have trouble getting here on a regular basis on a Sunday morning. Average church attendance on Sunday morning is about once a month. 60 consecutive days, 100,000 people got saved. Man, it, it is something that will be forever etched in my mind. The power of God, people were set free. People were, I mean, it, it was just an incredible. People were healed all over the place. It was just an amazing, amazing thing. Actually, you can go on YouTube and watch some of it. It's, it's pretty dang awesome. And one of the things that he did was, was he would just say this very, this one little phrase. He'd say, Oime bien Satanás. And, he, and this means, listen to me, Satan. And he took authority over the dark places in that community. And through that, through preaching Jesus Christ, the authority that he had through the power in Jesus' name, people were healed, set free, delivered. I mean, it was, it was a sight to be seen. What would that look like here if we did the same thing? And so when we participate in the promise, when we participate in the work of the Holy Spirit, things like this, we begin to see things like this. It's not our doing, but we're inviting the Holy Spirit to do a work. We're inviting and we're submitting to the Holy Spirit, say, saying, Lord, I want whatever you want. I want, I'm submitted fully to that. And we, when we all, as a body of believers, do this, great things take place. When we participate in the promise, it invites others to partake into the Holy Spirit also. And so we see this excitement taking place in the early church. And I'm going to introduce you to a new word, and it's called ecclesia. Everybody say that, ecclesia. 
ekklesia. It's a Greek word. And, and really the word itself is just, it just means a general assembly. It's a gathering of citizens. But then Paul actually kind of redid this and reworked the definition of this. But this is really what the church began to look like. This gathering of believers that took place. This ecclesia. We see this word 118 times in the New Testament. This word is it's used 24 times in the book of Acts. And we see the same word when Jesus was affirming Peter. We see this in Matthew 16. He says, now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter, he says this, he says, you are the Christ, you are the son of the living God. And Jesus answered, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for your flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church, ecclesia. I will build the church and all of the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. It is through this, this ecclesia, that there is power when we are all gathered together in one accord, when we are in one spirit, in one mind. We are all praying towards one thing, and that is the name of Jesus Christ. When we are all together, something incredible takes place. And this is exactly what we begin to see in Acts chapter 2. It's like through repentance and through pointing people to Jesus, when people confess their need for him, they confess their sins, they are baptized then then they are filled with the holy spirit and now we get to get to the good part see there's we can't skip things we can't skip the steps of repentance and just enjoy the fellowship no there's an important part for us to to actually confess our need for him confess our sin to him repent to the lord And then when all of that takes place, then we see the fruit of this in Acts 2.42. And when they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread, they devoted themselves... You know what the apostles were teaching? They were teaching about Jesus. They were teaching about Christ and Him crucified. They were teaching about repentance They were teaching about baptism. They were teaching about the essential doctrines. It wasn't anything complicated. It's just saying, you need Jesus. You need Jesus, and and we all need Jesus. And for us to get Jesus, it just takes us repenting and saying, Lord, I need you. Thank you for your forgiveness. They devoted themselves to gathering together, learning about what Jesus did. The power of the Holy Spirit began to move through this teaching of Jesus and through prayer and through fellowship and breaking of bread. And I love this, how it's it's annotated in here that they broke bread together because we know that Jesus is the bread of life. And so here they are, they're breaking bread and, and they are remembering Jesus through the breaking of bread. We see this. And this teaching in Luke uh, chapter 22 says, that, and they took the bread, this is talking about Jesus, he took the bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and gave it to him saying, this is my body given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. See, the early church, yes, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, teaching about Jesus, but they were also saying, hey, when we break bread, we're going to remember him too. Verse 43 says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. Everyone was in awe of what the Holy Spirit was doing. And let me just tell you what they were doing. They, they were doing what we see in Matthew chapter 10. They were proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so they were going to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the leopards, to cast out demons. This is why they were all in awe. 
They were in awe because they saw people that were walking in power and authority of the Holy Spirit. They were walking fully submitted to the work of the Spirit. And through that, signs and wonders took place. And because of all of that, all together, the Lord added to their number about 3,000 people. Supernatural things, supernatural miracles took place. And so I promise you that everyone in this room, you would be in awe too if you begin to see signs and wonders. You begin to see people healed. You know, I mean, we get, we're in awe when we see people get saved. And that's the very first miracle. What if we saw people be healed? What if we saw the lame walking? What if we saw the blind see? What if we saw the things that we read about? Man, how awesome would that be? That is something that I continually pray for. I think it's going to take all of us together believing that God wants to do something like this. All of us together, not just, not just gathering and just taking it in, but truly pressing into the Spirit of God, asking Him and inviting Him in. And saying, Lord, do what you will with us. Do what you will in this place. See what he does. Lord, show us. So through all this, and this is just to end it here. We see that in verse 45, they were selling all of their possessions and all of their belongings and they were distributing the proceeds to all. And as, as any had need, and day by day, man, this is every day, they went to the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. Man, they had a great small group system, I'm telling you. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They were praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. When people are on fire for God, people take notice. When people have experienced the power and, and the work of the Holy Spirit in their life, you're different. And when, when you are different, people take notice and people say, I don't know what it is that you have, but I want some of that. I want what you have. I see that you're different. I know, I know what you used to be like. I know that you used to be this, but now you're different. And something, I don't know what happened, but I, I, something's different. And this gives you the opportunity then to say, you know what? Yes, I was different dead, but now I'm alive in Christ. Yes, I was lame, but now I'm walking for Jesus. Yes, I am able to do these things through the power of Jesus Christ that is in me, through the Spirit of God that is living inside of me. I'm different. This is what, man, talk about a church growth strategy. I don't even care about that. I want the Spirit of God in this place. And I want the Spirit of God to do what He wants to do. And if He wants to grow this place, man, so be it. I want a people who are moved by God. And moved by God to do what He wants us to do. I want us to become this church. I, I see us being faithful. And, and there are elements in this passage of Scripture that I want us to take note of. Because I believe that there are some things that we are getting right. But I think there are some things that we, we probably should actually turn our focus towards. But I believe that we are being faithful to the message of Jesus Christ and the Word of God. I believe that we are doing that right now. But I also see us being a house of prayer. I see us being a place of healing. I see us being a place where the power of God is evident. I see us being a church that is unified. I see us being a church that is generous with everything that we have. I see us being a church that loves community. I see us being a church that praises God and has favor of, of him. I, and I see us being a church that is growing, not because of Pastor Dan, not because of anything else, but the power of God is evident in this place. That is the most attractive thing that any church can experience and have is that God is moving in a place and so people want to be a part of that. But it begins with repentance. See, we want to get to the good stuff. And many times we kind of do this. We kind of look at 
a person next to us or the person down the row, and we think, yeah, they do. They do need to repent. <laughs> I've seen their Facebook posts. They do, they, they really, they need to come to Jesus meeting with the Lord. And we fail to look in the mirror. See, when we say that about them, we're saying it about ourselves too. So I'm going to ask you today, what is it that you need to repent of? If we want to get to the good part of, man, enjoying the favor of God and enjoying this fellowship and community and ecclesia, what's your part? What is, what is your part in this? What part do you need to confess to the Lord? My part is, man, I, I'm confessing my pride. Where there's many times when I can just operate in my own strength. I'm confessing my need for the Lord. I'm confessing that I don't have it all figured out. But I'm depending on him. I'm confessing that I need to live my life better. I'm confessing that I need to love you better. And I'm repenting of that. What is your part today? This isn't a time for you to feel condemned or anything else. But if we're going to be everything that God is calling us to be, and we want to enjoy what we see and read about the early church, we've got to take a look in the mirror. What do I need to confess to the Lord? What is my part in this? How do I fit in? How am I, how am I uh, sharing in my resources? How am I serving in this place? Man, there are, there are many of you that totally enjoy the fellowship here in this room, but I'm telling you that we have people that serve week in and week out in, the, in kids' ministry that desperately need help. But we enjoy the good part of all being here together. But there, are, there is a faction of people within this church that serve faithfully, that give faithfully, that you are beneficiaries of that charity, of that generosity. And so I'm going to ask you if we're going to be the church that God is calling us to be, we're going to have to all be in it together, serving together, giving together, depending on the Lord together, being yielded to the Holy Spirit together. It's going to take all of us together doing this. We can't just leave here or come here, enjoy a message, enjoy some worship and leave. I want you to leave here uh, as the people were asking Peter, what, what, what do we need to do now? I'm telling you what you need to do. First, it begins with repentance, yes. But then the second thing is how can I, how can I serve this house? How can I be part, truly be a part of ecclesia in this place? This is what the Lord is calling us all to do. Play a part in His church. What is your part today?